Thank you all for joining us. Uh, I appreciate you all being here. Um, we are just about to get started. If you would like, uh, I invite you to introduce yourself in the chat box. It's the um, little speech bubble down below at the bottom of your screen. You can introduce yourself there and perhaps um, share how your loved ones have been affected by traffic violence, um, if you like, uh, or perhaps uh, mention a memory in honor of someone that you love deeply. Um, we'll get started in just a couple of minutes. I thank you all for joining this conversation about the importance of the World Day of Remembrance for road traffic victims. This is an opportunity to honor local families who have been affected by traffic violence and to talk about how we can take action um, in their name to for safer streets. Welcome to all of you. Um, I'm recording this session today, so it will be available uh, tomorrow. I will send up a follow-up email that will include a link to the recorded session as well as uh, extra details. Um, if there are questions today that need a little bit more than a little bit more time than we have available, then I would be happy to share that with you as well. Um, I'm going to keep all of the attendees muted for right now. Um, there will be a, an opportunity for questions and sharing later on um, in the session, but for right now, uh, everybody's going to stay muted. Uh, if you do have questions or if you'd like to share something, please definitely um, mention that in the, in the chat box. The pandemic Where has the been- chat box? Oh, sure. The chat box is, it's a little speech bubble down at the bottom of your screen um, and it says chat on it. And so if you click on that, it will pop up a chat box on the side. I don't see it. I wonder if yours looks different than mine. Um, Say that again, I missed it. I wonder if yours looks different than mine. It's, now I slid over, now I see you and I see Mr. Kelly and I see someone else while ago, I didn't see that. Let's see. Mrs. Hill, I think it might be um, because you're you're doing it on your phone. Um, oh, yeah. Different um, yes. setups. Um, yes. I, I tell you what. I didn't. I, my grandson has the, the laptop, and I don't know how to work it. <laughs> um. Well, for for right now, um, just the the main thing is, um, if um, we can put you on uh, mute just for a, a few minutes, um, while we introduce um, Amy Cohen, um, then sure. Yeah. So okay. Thank you. Uh, All right. Sure. Um, so the pandemic is accelerating uh, many trends and big changes that were already in progress um, and laying bare some inequities that we've uh, known have existed for years. Our Let's Talk series is a conversation with leaders in the Kansas City region to find out how that acceleration is happening locally for transportation, health, equity, and sustainability issues that are core to Bikewet Casey's mission, as well as some intersectional issues that often overlap with our work. So things like racism, housing, economic development, and more. Uh, Michael, Michael Kelly is our policy and advocacy manager at Bikewet KC, and he's going to um, introduce our guest speakers today. Uh, Michael? It's all yours. Um, thank you, Liz. And um, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, again, my name is Michael Kelly and I'm the policy manager for Bike Walk KC. And um, today we are joined by Amy Cohen, um, the co-founder of Families for Safe Streets. Um, Amy will uh, talk a little bit more about her background, but um, she is the co-founder of the organization Families for Safe Streets, which is a, a group of um, parents, children, relatives, friends um, of people who have been um, lost or otherwise impacted by uh, traffic violence. Um, we uh, will be hearing from her about the work that she has done in New York um, and in other parts of the country to um, promote and develop uh, Families for Safe Streets. We're also fortunate today to be joined um, by some of the um, survivors and the families of victims of uh, traffic violence here in Kansas City, including 
um, Nora and Zowie, um, Gloria Bunch, and Charlene Hill. Um, I will, uh, we will get a chance um, to hopefully hear from all of them um, in this hour, but um, at the moment I did want to um, welcome uh, Miss Amy Cohen and um, pass the mic to her. So uh, Amy, the floor is yours. Uh, Amy, you're muted. <laughs> How's that? We can hear you. Okay. Okay. Uh, but how did I skip ahead on my slides? Okay, this isn't working so well. Give me one sec. I think I'll just shrink this down. And go back to the top and present. Okay, sorry about that, technical di difficulties. So I'm honored to be here today to talk about, you know, World Day of Remembrance and traffic violence and what you can do to make a difference. Um, so we're going to go over a little bit about Families for Safe Streets, World Day of Remembrance, the epidemic of traffic violence, some Q&A, and then closing with a moment of silence. So we gather this week, just days before this Sunday, November 13th, will mark 25 years since a group of European advocates got together and planned the first World Day of Remembrance. And it's been continued every year on the third Sunday of November. This year also marks 15 years since it was recognized by the United Nations. And six years ago in New York City, a group of family members from Families for Safe Streets, we came together and in our first year, we brought um, the World Day of Remembrance here to the United States. This year, we're working collect collectively with FSS chapters and street safety organizations across the country, offering a range of in-person and virtual events, both on World Day of Remembrance and the weeks leading up to it. So we come together as crash survivors, victims, advocates, concerned members of our community, dignitaries, faith leaders, and so many more to remember, support, and act. That is the international theme for this year's World Day of Remembrance. It's a challenging time to mark the event, but we've done so much creatively and safely, and we're, I'm honored to be part of this event today. Um, so first, I wanna start with the theme of remembrance, remembering. For me, it's been seven long years. On October 8th, 2013, my son Sammy became one of the 100 Americans killed on, that, on our roadways on that day. Um, he was a great kid, full of wonder, smart, adorable, and he deserved a chance to grow up and make a difference. You know, that morning, we'd had a little spat the day before, he had wanted to stay home and study for a specialized high school admission test that they offer in New York City. And I made him go to a family friend's house and he was so mad at me. He didn't talk to me all night. We woke up in the morning, we made up, he kissed me goodbye. He said, I love you, mom. And that was it, I never got to see him alive again. So his death was preventable and we have the cure, but not the political will to do something about it. So today I remember Sammy and, I, and I'm honored that you let me share his story. Today we wanna to remember some other folks from Kansas City, from your community who've been persecuted by traffic violence. So I'm gonna turn it over to Michael to introduce these folks and to share their stories. Thank you, Amy. Um, I wanted to start by um, telling everyone about um, Anthony Saluto, the man on the left. Um, Anthony um, was a, a young man who was um, biking along Independence Avenue um, on April 3rd, uh, 2016, when um, he was uh, struck by a driver who was going over the speed limit under the influence of several drugs and fled the scene um, immediately after the crash. Um, Anthony, unfortunately, did not survive injuries, um, and the driver 
was ultimately sentenced to um, four months um, incarceration and uh, five years probation. Um, I want to turn it over to um, Nora to um, share her story. Thanks, Michael. Um, try and keep it short. It's still fresh, so it seems like there's a lot more than uh, you would normally assume. But my name is Nora, and um, I'm also a victim of uh, road violence. I'm lucky enough to be here today. And in a way, the reason I am is because I didn't see it coming, which kind of points to some of the issues that I think Mike Watt Casey is trying to address as far as distracted driving and like our public infrastructure and ensuring that we are aware that this there is a human cost to um, these kinds of traffic accidents. But in some, what happened, um, it was a Saturday night June 2nd, 2019, so recent, it was like 16 months ago, about, and a friend of mine and myself were in Waldo at the intersection at 74th and Bornal. and if you guys know that intersection, it's fairly, fairly busy, but it was Saturday night, people are out and about, um, and we had decided to leave this bar early, go across the street, and grab an Uber back home, and as we exited, we went to a crosswalk, we waited, we got the right away, a car yielded for us, everything was fine. And we made our way. And the last thing I really remember is looking to my left and talking to my friend Evan and everything all of a sudden going black. And in my mind thinking, okay, I've been impacted. And the hours, like especially the following moments that followed that were just snapshots of consciousness, confusion, not understanding, like not knowing I was hit. I ended up having, you know, feeling my head and blood coming from my head and my left side was numb and my right leg wasn't working. And I look over at Evan, he's across the street and glass is smashed in his face. And people are just gathering around us saying that, you know, you've been hit, you've been hit. And it, it took a while to process until you know, they said it's a white Prius and somehow my mind made that connection. Oh, I got hit by a car. And um, I got loaded up into the ambulance, taken to the ER, you know, and anyone's kind of been like critical, the critical unit, you know, they tear your clothes off and they cut everything off. They take off your earrings that so was put in like a head brace. And then I just sat for three or four hours, not knowing what was wrong with me or what had happened or what was gonna happen. I didn't have any information. I didn't know if my friend was alive or dead. And um, the injuries were pretty serious. Granted, like they could have been way worse. And when I said, I didn't see it happening, this driver came out of nowhere. And my hypothesis is that my body didn't tense up I was hit at 35 miles per hour. My head like went against the windshield. They found out here in the windshield. So my suspicion is that be, I'm still able to even be here because um, it was out of nowhere and um, my body didn't react that way. And so it wasn't as painful, but uh, concussion and a very bad concussion, post-concussion syndrome, still have to go and see a neurologist, you know, to this day. I shattered my fibula, my leg. Um, my friend had very similar injuries, broken bones, concussion. Both of us were in grad school. I was in my last semester of grad school. I don't know how I was. I couldn't work. I was beyond employable. I was beyond employable for a long time. Um, and I was confused. I had no idea what had happened. This is where it gets messy. So I'm just gonna try and like, you know, you can find out more about that later. But in some, uh, someone reached out on Facebook. I don't have one, but a friend of mine does. And it was a witness. This witness happened to be, she was like, I wanna get in contact with the victims. Happened to be that car that had yielded for us at the crosswalk. And so when she called, she was just like very upset and crying. She had seen it all happen and thought we were dead. She saw the car hit us. She had talked to the police, given them her name and number, and they didn't really write down her statement. And she was just kind of worried. She had a bad feeling about what was happening. Um, 
she saw Evan flying in the air. So I, I thanked her and waited for the police report. And once I got the report, I saw that a lot of the issues that intersect with pedestrian safety, you know, whether it's uh, kind of victim blaming on those that are not drivers of the car or racism. My friend Evan was black and that was a highlight, a big portion of that report. The report was just there, all the blame was put on us. The driver had insurance listed, um, but no reason, not, not even failure to yield. He said he tried to stop, but if you're going 35 in a 35 mile per hour area, that I don't think he tried to stop. And I go to the witnesses, the woman I spoke to, no, the, wit the witness statements were, hers was false. I mean, it wasn't what she had said. And I, I contacted her, the other one mirrored that. And um, I was just in disbelief. I couldn't pay for my medical bills. I couldn't work, I couldn't do anything. I felt like I was crazy because I would go and try and seek help, but I filed a complaint with the Office of Community Complaints. Nothing came from that. Um, my insurance company, it turns out there was no insurance. The, the officers had just written something down. They never validated that this driver had insurance. So he just, he literally, I mean, we should have been dead but he just drove off the scene in his car, not fined, not anything, not held accountable for any of his actions. I have no idea. My help, my under insurance wouldn't cover my bills because the report was been so slanted. So the months go on and I figure I've just got to eat the cost. That's just life, you know? Um, I'm trying to get better. My leg heals, my head, you know, I'll never quite be the same. Um, but I just go on and uh, after I call over and over again to see if anything transpires with the report, at the very least amend it so I can get my bills paid. So my insurance company will take it. Uh, a friend of mine, an acquaintance of mine that I know you all know, Pablo Sanders, got hit by, um, when he was biking. And that really came as a shock because I started to see this isn't isolated to just me. And then the day after that, my friend Ari, who I also had known for quite some time, got hit um, in Overland Park, both of them in areas where I feel like we're kind of similar to where I was. They're fairly highly trafficked. There, it is, there are things in place to try and coordinate, you know, cars and pedestrians, but it, it's not it's not conducive still to safety of everyone, but, um, and he passed and that's just when I lost it. I was so upset and angry and realized no one's ever gonna know what happens to them. No one could say anything for them. They can't say anything anymore. They're gone, we don't know. And so that's, I figured maybe I'm crazy. Maybe no one wants to listen to me. I know I've got a voice though. So. I, called that night and just called every reporter in the star and left messages and just spammed. And I was like, this is happening everywhere. We've got like, this is happening everywhere. And so communicated with them. I reached out to Eric Bunch, who I know used to work for Bike Lock KC. He told me about Vision Zero at city council. And so I went and attended that and um, was able to participate in helping um, testify so that legislation could be passed and that and through that learn about bike walk KC and um, I'm just thankful that I'm able to share my story and have that voice and and remind others that this happens a lot more than we realize and um, it's happening all around us so just thanks Amy and uh, thank you bike walk KC for letting me be here thank you um, very much, Nora, for, for sharing your story. I know it's, it's still very difficult. Um, I, I also wanted to give an opportunity to um, Mrs. Uh, Charlene Hill um, to um, speak about um, her grandson, Israel. I think we're still trying to figure out the issue with Gloria Bunch, his other grandmother, but we are going to hear from uh, Charlene at the moment. Um, so she should be able to unmute. Okay. Okay, here we go. We can hear you, uh, Mrs. Hill. Hi. Hi. Um, my name is Charlene Hill. <laughs> uh, my 
grandson, I'm going to say grandson slash son Israel was nine years old when we came to Kansas City on a vacation. Actually, I came for a class reunion and was going to make a vacation out of it and because Kansas City was home. And he was so excited because I had talked about Kansas City so much and all the things there and go chicken go and all those things. So he was just really excited to go. Uh, we got there and he has a, he calls her his aunt, but she's just a really good friend of the family since she was a friend of his mom's. Israel's mother passed away in 2014. But I have had Israel since he was four months old. I had to go get him uh, from Denver. We were living here in Cali. We live in Bakersfield, California. And uh, Israel's mom and Israel's dad had a very rocky re relationship and some things happened and she had to go to jail. So there was no one to take Israel. It was either us, me and my husband or the state and the state wasn't gonna get him. So I got up that morning on a Friday morning and I put, I put on clothes. I took two empty suitcases and I flew to Denver, Colorado. And I told her to load up what she could. So, and, and then she loaded up everything she could. I got back on the plane and came back the same night. So on a Friday, my husband always says, he calls me Mission Impossible. I got up with those empty suitcases and clothes on my back, picked him up and came back the same night. So he's been my baby ever since. And like I said, he was four months old. But anyway, I guess I'm getting off track. But we went to Kansas City for this for the vacation and the class reunion. And we got there Tuesday, did some things. I showed him all around Wednesday. And then uh, his aunt Lily, as he calls her, she had called and wanted to pick him up. I didn't know where she lived because I was on the Kansas City, Kansas side. She was on the Kansas City, Missouri side. So we met at a central location and she picked him up and she was taking him to some places. And she told me she would get back with me that evening so I could get him back. So that evening about 5.45, my phone rang and I thought it was her calling to tell me she was getting ready to bring him to me. I wanted me to meet her. And she was saying, get over here, get over here. He's been hit by a car. Well, I went into panic mode and I said, call the police, call the ambulance, call somebody, call somebody. So I called my sister, she's in Missouri. And I told her, she said, I know exactly where it is. I'm on my way. So she went over there. I keep waiting on somebody to call me back because I'm a panic. So I had a girlfriend in town from Texas and I asked her to come and get me, to take me over there. So in the meantime, I called my husband, couldn't get him and I called my son. So he, he answered and I told him, Leanne just said, Israel had been hit by a car. So he said, what's her number? I gave it to her. He called me back. He said, I can't make any sense out of her. Give me Auntie Corman's number. I said, okay. And I gave him her number. He called me back. And I knew it wasn't good because of the way he said it. He said, mom, and I knew he drug mom out too long. And he just said, I'm sorry. But, you know, that was one of the worst days of my life. And after going over there and seeing that street, that was a, that's a terrible street. I can't believe that that street, that they have not done something to that street. In all those years, the way that traffic goes in that park across the street from all those houses, I just, that was just unbelievable to me that, that nothing had been done. But uh, Gloria, his grandmother, she was started looking up some things and she found the article, some article and had where Bike Walk had mentioned that, that particular incident. And that's when she got in touch with Mr. Kelly. And then from, the, from then on, Mr. Kelly has been working with us and just introducing us to a whole new level of things with this. And I really didn't know that many pe people died from being hit by a car because I thought that they was gonna call me and say, oh, his arm is broke or something. But since then I have seen so many traffic fatalities where people have gotten hit by cars and, and they die. <laughs> Excuse me. And they die. So with this being said, I, I appreciate Mr. Kelly so much for all he's doing, all he's trying to do to help us. But I tell you, 
I just feel like this, if they had done something a long time ago with that street, this could have been avoided. If they would had speed bumps or stoplight or anything, maybe he wouldn't be, be dead today. You know, he had so much, he was such a precious child. He has so many dreams and visions. He always talked about what he was going to do when he grew up, who he was going to be, what he wanted to do for the world. He had a lot of living to do, but he was gone in nine years. But in those little nine years he was here, man, he put it in. He got so much done. He, he made such a difference in so many people's lives. You wouldn't have believed all the people that came out for him. At his funeral, it was in the article they had in the newspaper here about him. He was special and he is truly, truly missed. So, um, thank you, um, Mrs. Hill. Um, I also wanted to give um, Israel's other uh, grandmother a, a chance to um, speak briefly about her, grand, uh, her grandson as well. Um, let see, Mrs. Bunch. Okay. Hello? Yes, yes, ma'am. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Kelly. And to all, the, all of the participants and the victims and our host, uh, I just, I'm Israel's uh, paternal grandmother. And, um, and, you know, as Ms. Hill was saying, um, Israel was very special. Uh, I feel that he was anointed by God at, at the age of nine years old. He had so much wisdom. He had so much potential. And um, I first want to say, when when Israel, when I lived in Minnesota, Israel's mother called me and she said, Miss Bunch, she said, one thing I want you to do, I want you to always keep up with Israel. And I told her, I said, yeah, baby, that, that's, that's my grandson. And she said, I'm going to bring him in July to see you. We're going to fly out. Well, July never came because Sumitra passed away in June. And then um, in Ju July 19th, July, July 19th, 2019, Miss um, Hill had told me that she was, was going to the family reunion in Kansas City. And I didn't think I was going to be able to make it because my car was, was in the shop. I was going to surprise Israel and, um, because, uh, and, 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 and leave that Friday. I was going to surprise him. Israel and I always had a relationship. We talked on the phone. I sent things to him for his birthday, he and his brother, and, and for, for Christmas. We had a special bond, but we never met each other. And I was going to surprise him that Friday. <laughs> and on July 17th, July again, it never came. And at his funeral, I saw my grandson for the first time laying in his casket. It, it, it hurts. It hurts. But the consolation that I get is, is knowing that uh, when I get to heaven and when I see Jesus and I see my grandmother, I'm going to look around and I'm going to see my grandson, Israel, and he's going to know me and I'm going to know him. But my baby was gone too soon. I never got a chance to see him. And you can only imagine seeing him for the first time laying in his little casket. You know, it hurts, but I thank God that God has given me peace, you know, and I don't want, I don't want this to happen to nobody else. You know, I want us to be able to come together and do whatever we can to heal, to forgive, and to move on, you know, um, and to hold on to the memories that we have. because. It's traumatic for all of us, and it hurts, you know, and I especially, I especially, my heart just went out to Mr. and Mrs. Hill because at the time that, that Israel, she went and got Israel, 
I had had major, two major knee surgeries, I almost lost my leg. And I wasn't able to do anything, you know, as far as getting him. And I know it was traumatic when, when, when they lost Sumitra, the daughter. And it was traumatic even more for Samaki and for Israel because they found their mother, you know, in bed. She was gone. And so this, he was not only her grandson, he was her son, you know. And, uh, and I know that it's only by the grace of God that we're able to get through this and heal. But it's still going to take time. It's been, a, it's been since 2019, but still it hurts, you know, and I miss him so much. I used to call him my little pumpkin, you know, and he would call me G-Mama. And Miss Hill, she would call him Buddy. <laughs> so <laughs> we had had our own little pet names for him, you know, and stuff. And, and he was special. He was very special. And when I... When I when I contacted uh, Mr. Kelly, and Mr. Kelly, I thank you so much. You know, I contacted the, the the senator's office, and she got she gave me Mr. Kelly's name, and and the organization, the Bike Walk uh, of KC, because I wanted to do something. I wanted to do something in memory of not only uh, Israel, but the street that street. I tell you, it, 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 when I saw how the cars were were were, were speeding down that street, and Pula Israel was just trying to get over there to that park. He didn't know nothing about the area, but but there should have been some things in place, you know, the speed bumps, the traffic lights, or whatever. And that's what I want, so they won't happen to 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 anybody else, another child, another victim, you know, another another bike rider or, or whoever. You know, and um, and so that's that's what I'm 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 hoping that we can 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 on, not only you know memorialize uh, Israel's death, you know, but make sure that it doesn't happen to any anybody else, you know, and um, and thank you for the opportunity to just be a part of this meeting. Mrs. Bunch, thank you both uh, very much for um, sharing your your stories of Israel with us. Um, I wanted to close off um, this this one portion of our our presentation today by briefly talking about um, Carter Wright, the last person you see on your screen. Carter um, was a uh, young is a young boy who was um, unfortunately struck uh, by a driver in Fairway, Kansas. Um, or riding his bike, he was uh, seriously injured and spent um, a number of weeks in the hospital recovering. Um, he has been able to recover, um, but as his mother has said, um, it has spurred her to want to make changes to the built environment so that it does not happen to someone else. Um, these are just a few of the stories that we see here in Kansas City, and um, as you can as you've all been able to see and hear, um, it has a, a deeply negative effect on not just the people who experience them, but on uh, their families and friends as well. Um, and so with that, I would like to, to uh, give the floor back over to Amy so that she may continue. Thank you. So you heard those stories there's enough tears and heartache in this group to fill an ocean, but our ripples will make a difference. So our next, you know, we, we remember the second component, the most, you know, to remember allows you to support. And how can you be supportive? You know, there are a few key ways that if you know somebody who's been personally impacted like the people in this group, Acknowledge how they're feeling, ask about their loved one, ask what they need, help them connect with those who can support them. It really does make a difference because no one should have to go through this alone. 
And here at Families for Safe Streets, we offer a range of support services. We're based in New York City and we have chapters across the country, but with the pandemic we've been, we've realized there's a way we can come together more easily virtually. So there are two upcoming events I just wanted to mention and that we're doing tied into World Day of Remembrance. For anybody who's been personally impacted, we're having like an art related support community gathering this evening. And on Sunday at eight o'clock, we'll be closing out World Day of Remembrance with a virtual candle lighting. Both details on both are on our website and the World Day of Remembrance site, which Michael's gonna put in the chat. So the third component is what can we do now that you heard these stories of heartache and pain, what can we do to make a difference? Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip this, but my, my son's last thing that he did was to write a school assignment based on his name, Samuel Cohen Eckstein. What do the three components mean? And he talked about the invisible weight of leadership on his shoulders. Um, and so for all of you, I'm reaching out to you to, to step up and to become leaders to be inspired by these words written by my son and to, to stand up and make a difference, to be brave like Nora and the grandparents you heard from today. By sharing your story, by speaking out, it really does make a difference. So about Families for Safe Streets, we came together in New York City um, in 2014, just a few months after my son died. And we decided that we couldn't stand by and watch this continue to happen over and over again in our community. So our, our mission is to confront the epidemic of traffic violence through advocacy by fighting for legislative and policy change and providing support to those personally impacted. And when we came together, we really had no intention of growing outside of New York City, but others realized it really did make a difference by giving a voice to those personally impacted. So now we have chapters across the country and we are continuing to grow. We have 16 chapters in these communities. Maybe Kansas City will be next. And we've had many legislative successes, both in New York and across the country. In New York City, we lowered the speed limit. We fought and um, we successfully fought to have speed safety cameras. We've um, passed a major bill to redesign New York City streets comprehensively. They've had similar successes in DC and San Francisco and Austin, Texas and across the world. And I do just wanna share one small story about our speed limit fight. It was our first fight. We came together and we announced, you know, right after our first meeting that our, our, our first fight was going to be lower New York City speed limit. And people said it would take 10 years to pass the bill because it required a change to state law. And I have to say, I said, I don't think I could live in this pain for 10 years. It can't possibly take 10 years. There is way too much at stake. And our legislature in New York only meets every four months. Um, I mean, only meets for, 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 uh, for six months. And uh, we did it in that one six month legislative session, our first le legislative session. So people realized we really can make a difference when we share our stories. In addition, we offer, as I said, some support services and I encourage anyone in Kansas City who's been personally impacted to join for our cross country virtual support community gatherings. So what is Families for Safe Streets? Why is it so successful? When we um, reflected back when people were asking, why is it what, we, what you're doing is, is allowing changes in New York that people have been fighting for for decades? How come it's working now that you've stepped up and added your voices? And um, we kept with three key ingredients. The first is that it is a partnership. We, I like to refer to us as the involuntary volunteers. I did not sign up for this work. I would give anything to be doing something else and to not know about this problem. So we come to this not knowing really you know, the best legislative fights or the connections with elected officials. And so we work in partnership with a 50 year old street safety organization in New York City called Transportation Alternatives. And all of the chapters that have started since are paired with an organization like Bike Walk Kansas City. The second component is that there's not just one of us. You know, we can get burned out, we can feel very alone, but when we fight together, we give each other 
support and encouragement. I, I am not a naturally inclined public speaker. I really have no idea how I have ended up in this work and I could never have done it with all uh, without all of my fellow FSS members standing behind me. It also means when you have collective voices that you know, when it is the anniversary of the death or just a day you can't get out of bed that there is somebody else who can step up and speak out. And the third component is that um, we really use a technique of grassroots advocacy to, to fight and make change. In our mission statement, we say that we confront the epidemic of traffic violence and we use, chose that word confront very intentionally. We work inside the system, but we also are willing to stand up and push back when our elected officials are not doing what they need to do to fight for change. I wanna speak a little bit about the, the um, community organizing strategy, because in addition to it being work of grassroots activists at TA uh, with our voices elevating and amplifying what they've been fighting for for years, we also work in partnership with a lot of organizations. So for our fight for speed safety cameras, we built um, Transportation Alternatives largest coalition. We have 300 organizations who stood with us in support of getting speed safety cameras around schools. We had unions, hospitals, AARP, the Sierra Club, social service organizations, schools, PTAs, um, 300 organizations helping amplify our voices when, we were, when we're saying this is a moral imperative, we have to protect our kids. These folks were standing behind us saying, yeah, this is important. And these are the people who have a lot of political connections. So we're not gonna have time for that today, but Michael put in the chat, we have a video showing us our, our five-year fight to have the nation's largest speed safety camera program. And um, it, it, if you wish, you're welcome to take a look so you can get a sense of what advocacy looks like in action. Oops, nope, I don't wanna play that. Sorry, we don't have time for that today. So it is hard work. Uh, you know, I don't want to make it seem like it is easy, but it really does make a difference. Our voices really help put, you know, fight the pushback of people who are going to complain that you're taking away my parking spot when you build a complete street. Well, you know, we have our members, and I've done it many times. I'll stand up and say, my son's life was work worth a parking spot. So this is a quote from the New York City Department of Transportation Commissioner Polly Trottenberg, you know, really giving a testimony that we are the wind at her sails when she wants to make change and she's getting pushback. She knows we're there to back her up and hopefully she will be the next or, or it is looking like she may be the next uh, transportation secretary at the federal level for uh, President-elect Biden. So we may have an ally in the White House knowing that our voices make a difference and that change is essential. She'll be looking to us to help her pass um, change at the federal level. So raise your hand if you ever drove in a bit of a hurry to get to work or had to just glance down for a second at your phone, right? What we do at Families for Safe Streets is to try to help people understand why those things are not okay, right? We, Mothers Against Drunk Driving came together to show that it is culturally, in a, you know, to change the culture of, of drunk driving. And our role is to really change the culture of reckless driving. I mean, I used to laugh too. Yeah, it's funny. People have the term in New York to drive like a New Yorker. I don't know if they do the same kind of thing in Kansas City. But people, you know, joke about, oh, I love, you know, I like having a lead foot. Well, we're here to say that those things are not okay to change the culture to make that not socially acceptable to drive recklessly. So let's talk a little bit about this epidemic of traffic violence. Our right, slides like this one and the next one that made me realize that we really had to step up and, and, and speak out because look at these numbers. 40,000 Americans are, are killed on average in traffic crashes every day, more than are killed in gun violence. And in fact, that projection that they thought that fewer people, more people are gonna be killed by guns than cars never happened as projected. And that slide just, to, you know, they haven't, Bloomberg hasn't updated that yet. But this is, a, this is a deadly preventable public health crisis. 
and other nations are solving this problem and we are not. I mean, look at that slide. Look at all those countries who have half, a quarter of the traffic fatalities that we do. And theirs are going down and ours are going up. It's just unconscionable to me that we have allowed this to happen in our communities when we can see by looking at this slide that traffic violence is preventable. Here's another you know, statistic showing very similar information. And it's, it's a problem across the world. This is World Day of Remembrance. So I did wanna just also point out that there are 1.35 million people like my son and the people you heard about today who are killed in road crashes every year. And um, that's 3,700 people every single day and 20 to 50 million who are injured annually. 40,000 of those are Americans every year and millions of people are, are injured in the United States. And these are not accidents. We all use that word. Even I sometimes slip, I will admit, but we really are trying to change the nomenclature because an accident implies it was just like a whoops, like what, an act of God? No, these are preventable crashes. And um, by using that word crash, you are helping people understand the preventive nature of this problem. And you're also making sure that nobody blames the victim. So what causes crashes? I found this slide horrifying. It's like a huge percent of the time it is driver behavior. People like to say, oh, it was that pedestrian looking down on their phone, right? It's the walking while it, no. In the vast majority of instances, you know, uh, it, it, driver error played a huge role in the crash. That doesn't mean it's the role, of, we're gonna try to change driver behavior one driver at a time. There are factors and things that we can do to make it safer for everyone and the, and the most important really is to, to manage speeds on our roadways. Speed kills. The driver who killed my son was likely going 40. He was one of the red people on that slide who didn't stand a chance. If only the driver had been going slower, 20, 25 miles an hour, he would have had a you know nine out of 10 chance of surviving instead of nine out of 10 chance of being killed. So Vision Zero, which I know Kansas City has just adopted, for those of you who don't know, is, um, is, a, is a policy approach that switches from, uh, you know, uh, blah, it, it is a way to look at it much differently, taking a safe systems approach to eliminating all traffic fatalities and injuries. So not looking at changing one driver at a time, but changing policies and legislation so that we can eliminate the epidemic of traffic violence to make it unacceptable to say that people, you know, some people just have to die. That is not okay. And many places around the country are starting to adopt Vision Zero. Kansas City is a recent adopter and they have to lay out their implementation plan to show that they mean it in, in more than just a slogan and they will be added to this list as well. So what is Vision Zero? What is a safe systems approach? It, it means really focusing on the three E's, now the five E's, redesigning our streets for safety, you know, taking away street uh, width so that cars get a message, this isn't a wide highway that I'm driving on, this is a street that's shared with people who are biking, who are walking, so that it is safer for everyone. You design a complete street that allows uh, people to get around in all the different ways we get around in our communities. The second component is enforcement. And um, if you go back to that first slide, you'll see that engineering was the biggest component. It's getting the second is enforcement. And really the best way to do enforcement and what we've been pushing is automated enforcement, particularly in this era when we realize the racial injustices in our communities and the dangers that can escalate with live police enforcement. Um, we fought to have the, the nation's largest, it is now the largest um, automated enforcement program. And we also fought to implement it fairly. So the tickets are only $50. Um, 
and they're the cameras don't discriminate because they're they're not checking the ace rate or you know gen, race or gender of the driver so uh, I just want to have a, a little add a little bit more on enforcement. We came together with all the chapters across the country and issued this uh, statement on a, our fight for racial justice. And um, in it, I might I'm just going to read a, a teeny bit from it. I just got to find that piece. Uh, we say enforcement consists of many components, including traditional police enforcement, automated enforcement, and targeted investment. Uh, oh, here it is, I'm sorry. We need to reimagine ways to make us safe that don't necessarily involve traditional law enforcement. Instead, state, county, and municipal traffic enforcement must be the responsibility of unarmed officers, and the task must be reassigned from police departments to departments of transportation, public works, or a comparable entity. Because sadly, far too often, the police don't make our streets safe. And we need to be really conscious when we call for enforcement to do so in a way that is safe and fair and equitable. So Michael's going to put this statement, a link to it in the chat. Sorry, it took me a minute to find that language. The third component of Vision Zero traditionally has been called education. And again, this is an E getting smaller and smaller. The most important thing we need to do is redesign our streets and enforce our laws. And to the extent that education is important, it's really about raising awareness not just in general, changing one driver at a time, because that's really going to take too long, but to raise awareness that there are solutions out there that work to save lives, to, to use public awareness as, as a way to build support for the legislative and policy changes that are needed. In recent years, people have started to add other E's, like equity, to make street safety changes in a way that is fair for all people and to make sure we evaluate it and use a data-driven approach to implementing these solutions. So what can you do? Join the fight. Um, uh, Kansas City Bike Walk has a, you know, a, a very extensive advocacy agenda. They're working on a bike master plan. They're asking your city hall to create space for people. Please make sure to use appropriate language. Try to start calling them crashes, not accidents. Take the time to support those personally impacted in your community and consider bringing those folks together and becoming a chapter of Families for Safe Streets. But either way, you heard at the opening of this session how important it is to hear from people who've been personally impacted. They can help you sweep aside the opposition and really make a difference. So I'm gonna stop now and see if there are any questions. You know, we're running out of time, Michael. Yeah, I was going to say, since since we are running up on time, I did want to make sure we we still have the time at the end for the um, remembrance, um, the little short remembrance ceremony that you had planned. So um, we will uh, answer everyone's questions in the follow up email. So um, Amy, if you wanted to proceed. Sure. Well, Nora, do you want to read these closing quotes? Yeah, sure. Um, Rose Fitzgerald. It has been said time heals all wounds. I do not agree. The wounds remain. In time, the mind, protecting its sanity, covers them with scar tissue and the pain lessens, but it is never gone. Rose Fitzgerald Kennedy. No one is actually dead until the ripples they cause in the world die away. Terry Pratchett. I love these two quotes because I, I think it captures so well the work that we do. We carry this pain with us forever. There's so much data out there that shows that if you keep the pain inside, it will eat away at you. So we try to afford people the opportunity to have a productive place and a productive way to channel that pain because that pain is never gone. But our pain can make ripples to make change. 
to demand safer streets, to fight to re-engineer the streets in our cities and communities, to ensure that those changes are made because so much is at stake. And so I just wanted to really end today's session with a moment of silence, thinking of Nora and Israel and all the others in your community and mind the heartache and pain that we all face to take a moment to remember on this week of World Day of Remembrance. Thank you all for joining today, for sharing your stories, for opening your hearts and for standing up and making a difference. It really does work and it really is so important as we heard today. Thank you. Um, once again, um, Amy Cohen, uh, thank you so, so very much for um, sharing your story, sharing your pain and sharing the work that you were doing to make streets safer, not just in New York, but across the country. Um, to Nora, to um, Mrs. Charlene Hill and to Mrs. Gloria Bunch, um, thank you all for, for sharing your pain with all of us. Um, too often we, we hear about a crash and we just kind of move on, but it is important, imperative that we hear these stories um, and we are all made better when we hear these things. Um, Liz, were there any final comments that you wanted to offer? Um, Thank you, Michael. I've had a bit of a, of a Zoom kerfuffle. Um, I appreciate all of you for joining us today. Uh, like Michael said, I'll be following up tomorrow with an email that will include answers to any questions that we have, as well as these special links that Michael's included in the chat box. Um, and uh, you will be able to find the recording of this. So in case you didn't get to see the whole thing today, or in case you would like to share it um, with others, uh, we'll include the link to the recording. I'd like to thank um, our funders and sponsors for carrying us through 2020 this year. Um, we have many uh, folks, um, our members who have been extremely generous in supporting this work to make safe streets, streets safer for all in our region. And I would like to thank you for um, keeping up with it, uh, even through an especially trying year. All right. Um, well, once again, thank you everyone for attending. Um, Liz, as she said, will follow up with everyone. Um, Sunday, November 15th is World Day of Remembrance. Um, take a moment to think about um, the people you know who have been impacted by traffic violence and use it as an opportunity to commit yourself to making safe streets, not just here in Kansas City, Missouri, but throughout our region and across the country. Thank you, everyone.